Hey guys, what's up? I want to talk about set theory a little bit, and I'm going to assume that you know a little bit of set theory uh, for this talk. Um, what I really want to talk about are different sizes of infinity, and this is something that I think is really cool about uh, math in general, is that you can actually uh, say something like there are different sizes of infinity, and not only can you say that, you can really study the different sizes of infinity. So, yeah, like I said, I'm going to assume you know a little bit of set theory, just like the basics, you know, the idea of uh, what a set is, set intersection and union, um, and I'm not going to use intersection and union too much, but really I'm going to use uh, functions and the idea of an onto function um, to capture this idea of sizes of infinity. Now what I'm drawing over here, this is George Cantor. It's very important that we have a picture of him in our mind. He is sort of the father of set theory. Around the end of the 1800s, he said, hey guys, you know, set theory. And um, other people said, you're crazy. Because uh, he, in retrospect, they think he had bipolar disorder. He suffered from bouts of depression. And um, he did exhibit some strange behavior. But it turns out that set theory is basically spot on. Uh, great idea in math. There was one little paradox, Russell's paradox. Yeah, they kind of worked that out. But what I'm going to show you is a rigorous proof that there are different sizes of infinity. And let me give you a little preview of what I want to prove. Um, this is the set of natural numbers. It's written with that N with the double line there. And that is going to be, we're going to start with 1, 2, 3, and just keep on counting. So if you keep on counting, then I'll have this infinite set, and it's a set of natural numbers. And then I'm also going to have this other set, which is going to be the set of real numbers. And that's going to include everything on the real number line. It's going to include fractions, pi, e, negative numbers, uh, anything you can think of. I mean, it'll include the integers as well but um, anything that fits on the real number line. So here's the real number line. You know, it has zero. It has, uh, here's like, let's skip up the three. It has pi on it, six. So both of these are infinite sets. And actually it turns out that from a certain point of view, the set of real numbers is actually bigger than the set of natural numbers. Okay, so let me try and explain what I mean by that. So let's say we have two sets, x and y. Um, now I'm going to use the notation a uh, double line around the set x to represent the size of x. The size of x. And sometimes when we talk about the sizes of sets, we use this idea of a cardinal number. Um, and so I'm not really going to talk much about cardinal numbers specifically, but um, it's just good to know what that idea is. Cardinal number is a way to describe the size of a set. Um, and now to get started with proving different sizes of infinity, I need a definition for what it means for one set to be uh, greater than or equal to the size of another set. Okay, so I'm going to say that the size of x is greater than or equal to the size of y if and only if there exists a function f mapping x to y um, such that f is an onto function. And it kind of helps to draw a little picture for your intuition here to see what's going on. Okay. So I'm going to draw some points from uh, x and some points in y here. And uh, because they have this function from x to y, I can draw an arrow from every point in x, and it's going to end up at some point in y. And some arrows may point to the same uh, set point in y, but one thing that I know for sure is that every point in y is going to be hit by some point in x. Okay. So uh, another way to look at it is that um, from the point of view of y, everything gets hit. So in a way, I could sort of choose one of these arrows backwards, 
if I wanted to go from y to x, and I could sort of embed y within x. Um, so maybe in some cases, you know, you might have a choice of how you go from y backwards into x, but you get the sense that y could fit into x. Um, and that is the intuition behind this definition. That's why we think of y as being, maybe it's the same size, but it's definitely not bigger than x. Okay, so I, met, I, I suggest if you've never seen this before, to you know, kind of think about why that makes sense. Um, it also, it turns out that if, if you have um, both x is greater than or equal to y, and if you also know that y is greater than or equal to x in size, so that means you have some function, let's call f1, mapping x to y, which is onto, and you also have some other function, which maps y to x, which is also onto. Now, I'm not going to prove this, but you can combine these two things to uh, get a function mapping x to y, which is a one-to-one -one correspondence, which means that it is a one-to-one -one function and an onto function. And this sort of intuition uh, matches the idea that the sets are equal. Okay, so stop for a, thing, for a minute. Imagine you know that just a number x is greater than or equal to number y, and y is greater than or equal to x. Well, the only possibility is that they have to be equal to each other. That's the only way both of these can be true. So if we have sets and we have the same situation where they are both greater than or equal to each other, it still makes sense intuitively that they would be equal in size. And so this idea of sets being equal in size matches the idea of there existing a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence between them. And to draw the picture of a one-to-one -one correspondence, what it really means is that um, if I have these dots representing points, I can draw one line between any two dots, um, one on each side, and these lines, they never uh, cross, they never you know, no two lines go to the same point on y, no two lines go to the same point on x. Um, and sort of every point on both sides are hit. So this very strong idea of matching between the two sets. Um, one example is, let's say a bunch of married people, uh, just for this example, let's say they're all straight married people, go into a building. We have a set of men and a set of women. And you don't know how many people are in this building, but you know the number of men is equal to the number of women because they all went in and married couples. Okay, so that same idea where we don't know how many there are, but we know that they have to be equal um, because there's sort of this matching, this pairing between them. As soon as there's a pairing, we know they're the same size. And that's sort of one of the fundamental ideas of um, sizes of sets in set theory. Okay, so now let's talk about sizes of infinity. So whenever we have a set, let's say we have a set X, and let's say that I can list the elements like this, X1, X2, X3, etc. Um, and this keeps going, you know, for any uh, positive integer, there's some X sub K in, that, in this set X. So this is going to be called a countable set. And what it means for a set to be countable is just that um, basically it means that there exists a function mapping f, uh, mapping, say, the natural numbers to x. And this is an onto mapping. Uh, so you could think of sort of, uh, to fit this description, you could think of f of a natural number n is equal to x sub n. Okay, so let me give, uh, uh, let me give an example. Uh, the set z, and this is the set of all integers, including negative integers, and uh, zero and positive integers. By the way, z stands for Zollin. It's a German word meaning number. Um, that's why they use that letter. So z we can uh, come up with a, uh, this is a countable set, 
And what I could do is I could uh, come up with a correspondence like this. I could say uh, x1 is equal to 0. And then x2 is equal to 1. x3 is equal to negative 1. And then I could start repeating this pattern of the next two numbers will be uh, the positive and negative of whatever integer I haven't hit yet. Um, so we'll go 2, negative 2, 3, negative 3. And if I keep doing this pattern, I'll hit every number in z. Um, and so as a result of this, this is sort of like a, a way to count z, we see that z is countable. Okay, so in a way, now I'm not going to go into this in more detail, but it turns out that any time a set is countable, that it has the same size as the natural numbers. So this is true whenever uh, x is countable. Okay, cool. So now what I want to show that's interesting is I want to try to prove to you that the set R is not countable. Okay, so I'm going to call this my claim. My claim is that the set R of real numbers is what we call uncountable, which means that uh, there are more numbers in this set than there are natural numbers. So another way to say this is that the size of R is strictly greater than, not equal to, the size of N. Okay, so here's how we're going to prove that. This is proof. Uh, suppose it's false. Suppose not. And we're going to reach a contradiction. Proof by contradiction. Uh, if, if, so what we're supposing, we're supposing that the set of real numbers is less than or equal to in size the set of natural numbers. Okay, and by the definition of what that means, that means that there must exist some function which maps the natural numbers to the set of real numbers, which is an onto function. Okay, so basically um, what I have is I have this, this set of numbers, f of 1, f of 2, f of 3, and if I sort of complete that whole uh, sequence, where for f I just plug in every integer, what I would eventually come up with is the set of real numbers, because it's an onto function. If it wasn't an onto function, then I wouldn't know that it was equal to r. It could be a subset. Um, so it's important that it's an onto function. Okay, let me pull up a new picture here. So, all right. Okay, so how am I going to work with this? I have this function f that I've assumed exists. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out um, the decimal representation um, for each of these numbers. So now I'm just going to make up some numbers. And the reason I'm doing that is it will help explain the idea. Uh, what I'm choosing is sort of an arbitrary mapping. And um, you'll see that this idea that I'm explaining will actually work no matter what these numbers are. So just to repeat my goal, my goal is to reach a contradiction um, in a logical contradiction, which means that my assumption must be false. That's always the general idea with a, any uh, proof by contradiction. Okay, now this list keeps on going forever. And each of these decimal representations goes on forever. So what I've done is I'm, I'm just starting with the assumption that there exists some onto function from the natural numbers to the real number. And I'm pretending like I can write down these numbers. Now, the idea works even if you can't write it down, because it is infinite. But the idea is what's important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to now write down a new number, which I'll call x. And um, I'm going to write down the decimal representation for this number. Um, and this number will not be in my list. It's, a, it's going to be a real number that is not in the image of f. 
And that's going to be a contradiction because I assumed that f was an odd function. So let's write down this number. The first digit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this digit and I'm going to, uh, if it's for this digit, I'm going to say, I'm going to write down d plus 1 if d is uh, less than 8, let's say, and uh, d minus 1 if d is greater than or equal to 8. Okay, so this is the procedure I'm going to follow. So d is 3 right here. So uh, it's less than 8, so I'm going to write down 4. Now I'm going to look at the next digit of f2, second digit of f2. I'm going to change that to 7. Third digit of f3, I'm going to write down a 4. Fourth digit of f4, I'm going to write down a 6. Now let's say, and let's say, um, just to continue the example here, let's say uh, this is going to be, let's make this a 9, just so we see what happens when there's a 9 there. Um, well, in this case, I don't want to, just by this rule, I'm going to subtract 1. So I get a new thing here. So if I continue this process, I'm going to get a single number. And the interesting thing about this number is uh, for any k, this is not equal to f sub k. Because if I look at the kth digit of f sub k, it has to be different from the kth digit of x. I'll repeat that. If I look at the kth digit after the decimal point of f sub k, whatever number it is, it's going to be 0 through 9, it has to be different from the kth digit of this number x. Okay. So the conclusion I'm reaching from that is that, um, let's see, for all k, then f sub k is not equal to x. Right? But what this means is that f is not an onto function. All right. Now, if I go back to my assumption, I assume that there exists an f which is onto. Okay. Right here, onto. Right. Right here, not onto. Okay. So this is a contradiction. I'm saying that both f is an onto function and it's an not an onto function because it misses this number x. Um, and so the conclusion that you reach, whenever you get a contradiction, it means you've assumed something wrong. Um, so the conclusion is really that there does not exist an f mapping n natural numbers to the real numbers, which is onto. Okay, so this is the negation of saying uh, that r is less than or equal to n. So this is false. Right? In other words, much simpler way to write much simpler way to write this is to say the natural numbers is strictly smaller, not equal to the real numbers. Okay, QED. Now that, that proof is a little tricky, so I really suggest you take a look at this picture. And, and sort of try to convince yourself why the number x is, cannot possibly be in this list. No matter what this list is, x is not going to be in there. Um, and, and just as a final point, see how there's sort of a diagonal line here? That, that diagonal line here um, is why this is called a Cantor's diagonalization argument. Uh, it's basically because we look at we, we sort of look at the kth digit for the kth number. And, and sort of, you know, if you think of y equals x as a graph, it's a diagonal line. So, you know, there's sort of a diagonal line going on. So it's called the diagonalization argument. And um, this really kind of changed math. Because uh, before then, people didn't really think about infinity as something you could really prove things about so much. Um, so, thank you.